Welcome to the History of the Papacy podcast, a podcast about the history of the popes of Rome and Christian Church. Prepare yourself to step behind the ropes and leave the official tour of the story of the popes and Christianity. I'm your host, Steve Guerra, and I thank you for joining me on this journey. You can find show notes, how to contact me, sign up for our mailing list, and how to support the history of the papacy by going to our website, a2zhistorypage.com. Two great ways to support the history of the papacy are leaving your ratings and reviews on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. And another really great way to support the history of the papacy is by going and joining us on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash history of the papacy. Your support on Patreon goes a long, long way to help keep the history of the papacy sustainable for a long time in the future. There are four tiers of support on Patreon, Antioch, Alexandria, Constantinople, and Rome. Each of these tiers represents one of the traditional patriarchates of early Christianity. There are many great benefits to you for supporting the show on Patreon. You will receive early and advertisement-free content, bonus episodes, monthly book drawings, and most importantly, you will be included on the history of the papacy diptychs. In traditional Christianity, the diptychs are the lists of bishops commemorated in order of their precedence. The sooner you sign up on Patreon, the higher you'll be on the lists of the history of the papacy patrons. I want to send a very special thank you out today to our newest Patreon, um, patreon.com forward slash history of the papacy, Chris, at the Antioch level. Thank you so much, Chris, for choosing to support the history of the papacy on Patreon. And now with the history of the papacy diptychs, we have at the Alexandria level, Roberto, William B., Brian, Christina, Alex, Augustus, and Judy. At the Constantinople, we have Dapo, Paul, Justin, Lana, John, Steve, and Sean, all of whom are magnificent. And reaching that ultimate power and prestige, that of the Sea of Rome, we have Peter the Great, Amma the Great, Geoffrey the Great, Frederick the Great, and Jim the Great. And with that, here is the next piece of the mosaic of the history of the Popes of Rome and Christian Church. Today we have a new series. There's going to be a couple of episodes that come out that I recorded with Scott McAndless, who is the host of Retelling the Bible podcast, and Gary Stevens, who you well know is the host and producer of the History in the Bible podcast. We'll explain the series a bit more as we get into these episodes, but we're basically looking at one part of one episode from Scott's podcast where he brings up and dramatizes one story from the Bible. We listen to this section of Scott's podcast and just talk about it. And we look into the background and the context of this one one particular episode from the Bible. So if you have any questions or comments, please reach out to us because we'd love to hear them And definitely tune into Gary and Scott's podcasts. You will definitely hear more of these stories as well. So let's get into it, and I will talk to you next time. Welcome to another three-way collaboration between Scott McCandless of Retelling the Bible, Steve Guerra of the History of the Papacy podcast, and me, Gary Stevens of History and the Bible. In this episode, we investigate Samson's father, Manoah. As usual, we begin with an excerpt from Scott's retelling. And here's an excerpt of episode 5.19, Me, Myself, and Manoah. You can be sure that over the years that followed, Manoah told the story of the following several minutes, many times over, to what ever audiences he could persuade to listen to him. But he always struggled to describe 
the man of God. He would just mumble words like shining and shimmering, wings and circles. But he knew that, strictly speaking, none of those words actually described anything that he had seen. He just didn't have words for what stood before him. But for the moment, he only had one question that he could ask. Uh, uh, are you the man who spoke to this woman? He said, gesturing to his wife who just was coming up behind him. The man of God rolled his eyes and glanced at the woman as if to say, You have to deal with this all the time? The woman shrugged. I am, said the angel of God, almost as if it weren't completely obvious. Then Manoah said, Now, when your words come true, what is to be the boy's rule of life? What is he to do? The angel sighed deeply. You brought me here to ask that? I already told your wife what was needed. She may not eat of anything that comes from the vine. She is not to drink wine or strong drink or eat any unclean thing. She is to observe everything that I commanded her. I already told her everything that needs to be done so that this boy can be raised to be a Nazarite to God for his whole life long. Why didn't you just listen to her rather than bothering me with your silly questions? After a few moments of awkward silence, the man of God again heaved a large sigh. Well, uh, if that's all, I suppose I really ought to get going. You really have no idea how busy things can get when you're the angel of Yahweh. Why, I've got seven more infertile women to visit this afternoon alone and... Manoah interrupted with a desperate bid to keep this encounter going. Wait! He cried. Allow us to detain you and, uh, and, and prepare a kid for you. The angel of Yahweh glanced at a strange glass disc that was strapped onto his wrist with a piece of leather. If you detain me, he said, I will not eat your food. Then he looked up to see that Manoah was almost on the verge of tears. He had an infantile expression that reminded the angel of a baby that has just been deprived of its favorite toy. Uh, but, he continued, if you want to prepare a burnt offering, then offer it to Yahweh. Then Manoah said, and what is your name, so that we may honor you when your words come true? Why do you ask my name? The angel of Yahweh snapped. It is too wonderful. Okay, Scott, well, you came up with a lot more ideas than Steve and I had. And I must admit, the story of Manoah. Well, that has certainly gone over my head, or I'd simply just blurped when I was reading about Samson. I mean, Manoah must be one of the least known people in the Old Testament. Until you brought him up, I thought, who? Steve here. We are a member of the Parthenon Podcast Network, featuring great podcasts like Mark V. Nett's History of North America podcast. Go over to ParthenonPodcast.com to learn more. And now a quick word from our sponsors.
I think it's a perfect story, though, because it crosses a lot of the streams that we've done. If people remember, we Gary and I put Samson on trial, and then our fellow collaborator, Gil, did an entire Gil Kedron of the, the podcast of Biblical Proportions did an episode on Samson. So there's a lot of Samson. Let's I think talking about his dad, it makes a lot of sense, especially first off. Now, now, Scott, could you please introduce Manoah, or as he is known in Hebrew, Manoah? But I'm not going to use that guttural at any time from now on. But yes, let's let's admit that we we are English speakers and that we don't pronounce the Hebrew properly. We'll use the names that we're comfortable with. Yeah, I mean, it is kind of amazing. He's got this whole chapter to himself in the Book of Judges, and yeah, not a lot of attention to it. Actually, I think probably the first thing that brought me to Manoah's story was um, Samson's story, because the story that everyone always concentrates on with Samson is, is, of course, Samson and Delilah, the big ending and, and all of that stuff that goes with it. But I was kind of struck as I was reading by the beginning of Samson's story, like in chapter 14, it starts out, you know, Samson, he's living with his parents, he grows up, gets to a certain age, and he goes to a place called Timnah and he sees a woman. He comes back to his dad and he says, I saw a Philistine woman in Timnah. Now go get her for me as my wife. And the father says, oh, can't we find you a nice, you know, nice, good Hebrew child, uh, Hebrew woman to, to marry? The response that Samson gives really stood out to me. Get her for me because she pleases me. And for me, that sort of encapsulates what for me. Uh, I think somebody already mentioned that that Samson is a bit of a he's, he's a bit of a bastard or he's, he's not a great character. Uh, a perfect example of toxic masculinity, which eventually, of course, bites him in the end, you know, but here he sees this first woman that he sees or the first woman he notices this beautiful object that he wants to possess. You know, what a horrible example of misogyny, treating women like an object. And so I started asking, well, where did he get that from? kind of obvious answer was, well, that's the kind of thing that we learn from our parents. Verse uh, chapter 13 of the book of Judges is the story, especially of Samson's parents, but especially of his dad. The thing that strikes me about the story is it fits into a pattern uh, in the Bible. Like, as you know, as I think we all recognize and admit, the Bible's a very patriarchal book, very much focused on men. Women aren't given important roles at all, aren't given speaking roles for the most part, except in one case. And that is when it comes to uh, stories about bearing the children, the boys, the sons that are going to save the nation. And so all of the stories of the important children being born, you know, whether it's Isaac or Jacob, are all actually focused on the women. And the story is very, it's a trope. It's repeated so many times in the Bible. The woman is infertile. It is just assumed, you know, this patriarchal assumption, it's her fault. Samson's mother doesn't even have a name. But the thing is, when, you know, these stories of these women, these infertile women struggling to have children, all of a sudden, they become really important. You know, Sarah, struggling to have a child, she gets a speaking role. She gets to do things, decide things. The story of Rachel and Leah and their competition to have children, they are very active, they are speaking, they are making decisions. And usually in these stories, the men, the, the fathers, they're just these incidental side characters. All of the story of Rachel and Leah having children, Jacob does almost nothing. Basically, various times his wives tell him, oh, you're sleeping with you know, you're sleeping with Leah tonight, or you're sleeping with, with me tonight, and Jacob's just there going, oh, okay. <laughs> he, doesn't, he doesn't choose anything. He doesn't say anything. That's the one thing that really, with the, so many of these uh, Old Testament stories, yeah, it's very patriarchal. But in the end, uh, uh, most of the time, the patriarchs kind of come off looking like buffoons. Jacob gets played time and time again by his kids and, and his wives. Isaac gets played by his wives and his kids. And 
I think that plays Samson that goes definitely that Samson, besides the Manoa part, never seems to really fit. It seems like something that's just been slapped on. And then Samson looks like a buffoon. Maybe he's a boar and he's a buffoon. He's like every crude thing you can possibly have. I don't think he ever comes out looking really good in this story. I'm a big fan of the old-time actor Victor Mature, who, of course, was Samson in the movie Samson and Delilah. Now, looking back on that movie, none of the boorishness of Samson comes out. He's portrayed as a singular hero. It's actually very different to the story. Oh, and, and to this very day, you know, most of the literature that's written about Samson, it's, it ignores most of what it actually says in the Bible, how he's an idiotic and how he gets played and how he's toxic masculinity. This his heroic figure that everyone, every boy wants to be, and people ignore what's actually written in the Bible to tell the story they want to tell. And we do that a lot. That's one of the things I'm trying to, to counter. Let the Bible speak for itself. It's really, he's the, Jewish Christians, Hercules. But if you I listen, if you listen to Gill's episode, he really thinks that it was a Alexandrian Jewish take on Hercules and taking the whole Greek satire genre and flipping it on his head. He said, if you read it in Hebrew, it's hilarious because it, there's a, a lot of wordplay and that's a thing that uh, you know we Gary and I have talked about we lose so much of the wordplay and a lot of the subtleties of the literature when we're reading it in English that's been translated through by different sources to get to where we are I think that that especially goes with Samson because it's so inexplicable how terrible he is. And really his redemption at the end is that he kills a temple full of people. I would definitely buy that Samson, at least, you know, the main part of his story is taking that Hellenistic myth and remixing it. Yeah, that makes sense to me. The whole thing about the killing the lion and, and taking the lion skin. I mean, that is absolutely emblematic to um, Hercules. But I think probably the story of Manoa is very Hebrew. Because it's this old Hebrew trope of the infertile women and it, that same story that gets played over and over again. But I kind of find that what's going on in the story is that it's turned into a satire of the old Hebrew trope by Manoah. Because he doesn't play the role that he's supposed to play. He doesn't play a good Hebrew father in this old trope. He just inserts himself into the story. He demands to see the angel. He demands to get instructions from the angel uh, of what to do with this child. Well, his wife's already been given all this information, and all the angel does is repeat exactly the same information all over again. And it's just like, uh, again and again, he's just shown up as this, this buffoon. And so I think whoever wrote this, and I'm not going to be like Gil and try and assign a, an author, but is I, seems to be intentionally playing with the trope and perhaps therefore criticizing it and saying, maybe we need to look beyond this old trope and think that there's maybe some new way of looking at the whole crisis of how we can bear the children who are going to save our nation in times of trouble. That's sort of what I kind of see going on. Yeah, unusually, I mean, the wife is actually the central character, isn't she? I mean, she's the one that the angel appears to twice. You get the feeling that Manoah's going, what do you mean? An angel appeared to you. You're a woman. You're a woman. Why didn't he appear to me first? And the angel more or less just blows Manoah off. Yeah. <laughs> and says the same thing, that if only he had listened to his wife, he would already know. Obviously, this is not a guy who listens to his wife. So is, is the message maybe, men, pay attention, your wives or the women in your lives actually know a few things and maybe could teach you a few things? It's wonderful to see this biblical author subverting the tropes and, and the same old stories to maybe get across a fresh message. 
Now, I thought it was curious that the angel has instructions on what the wife should do while she's pregnant. Drink no wine or strong drink, eat nothing unclean. But the angel has no instructions for what her child should do. Not not in this section anyway. Now, the angel says, you shall be a Nazarite. Now, I've seen that also translated not as Nazarite, but as consecrated. I mean, in English, we take it as a term for a specific group of people. But I'm wondering if the Hebrew word Nazarite really just does mean consecrated, and English speakers have sort of reified that into a a group. I'm looking up the Hebrew word for you, but (laughs) if you give me a moment. Because if Nazarite is an actual, it's not just consecrated with a lower C, but it's consecrated as you're a part of a group. Like, isn't John the Baptist considered, or he took a Nazarite vow? So we could be making a connection back, a backdated connection. Well, it's it's the same thing in, in the in the Gospel of Luke, except the message is given to the Father, in that case, Zechariah, uh, that he is to be, I believe it is to be Nazarite from, from birth. I don't believe his mother Elizabeth is given specific instructions, as I recall. Yeah, the, the Hebrew word is is nazir, and it means someone who is con- consecrated. <laughs> it's the question of whether the original Hebrew word refers to a specific sect or right among the people, or is it a generic term that means um, consecrated? But like, it's it's used to also describe like grapevines that are are not harvested during the sab- sabbatical year. Uh, they are also considered nazir. So it's interesting, it would be translated, transliterated straight from the Hebrew instead of taking just consecrated, that maybe they did want to attach that name to a specific institution or concept. Steve here again with a quick word from our sponsors. You can imagine that there was there were at various times groups of people who who made these vows who are identified groups in society. So you can imagine using that word as a label, you know, just as you like we might call somebody monks or as we might call somebody followers of certain sects, but the word itself has another meaning, which is specifically consecrated. But getting back to Manoa, I think that it's always the Like you were saying is why put that bit on there if it is attacked on to a story to just get us to to tie us back into the story to tie maybe a story, a satirical story of a Hebrew Hercules. And you got to tack on this beginning to make it uh, basically to fit into all the standard tropes of the Old Testament. There must have been a Manoa that they're taking some pot shots at. It's so specific. I mean, none of the other judges have a backstory, do they, as far as I know? I mean, only Gideon. Gideon has, he has a bit of a backstory, his, his background and his family. Him and Samson are the ones that are developed. I guess that and Nisha to a certain extent, and Japheth too. I mean, Japheth is a, he's a fascinating character because he's an orphan and he's abandoned and he ends up among these. So there are, there are these stories, some of these stories do have backstories, but Samson's is quite interesting. Yeah, and quite long too. I mean, yeah, it's a whole chapter. Yeah, just on the birth. My question about judges is I don't, I've jumped in and out of judges, but the judges that I've read, it seems kind of a little random that there's these all these different stories that they smush together. Is is there a theme through it, or are they, they're all supposed to be this title of judge? But they seem to be all over the place in time as well. They're all over the place in time and geography. So obviously, you look at where this one is operational and this one. So there's not a single judge who seems to be active in all of the territory of you know what will eventually become Israel. Probably if there is a historical origin behind them, they're like local legends or local local heroes and stories that were told in this community or that community. And at some point, some Brothers Grimm came along and collected them on. But of course, in the book of Judges itself, they do have a theme theme is basically that, because they all follow the the same pattern, right? There's a judge, 
things go well for a while, the judge dies, the people of Israel fall into some sin or error, and then God brings another outside enemy and then raises an up another judge. And the, the refrain that keeps coming throughout the book of Judges is, well, there was no king in those days, so everyone just did what they wanted. Sort of this lament that the whole nation was in trouble because we didn't have a king. Because we need a king. Oh, where's this king going to come from? Not Israel, guys, because you don't exist anymore. Got to be the line of David, right? Yes. Oh, it is definitely part of the apologetic for, yes, the Davidic line and the kingdom based in, in Jerusalem and all of that. So there is definitely a message behind the overall story. But the stories themselves kind of do stand on their own, pretty much. They're not dependent one on the other, and the order doesn't necessarily matter. <laughs> it really could be, then, all these nuggets of history wrapped in legend. Oh, let's take them all together, mush them together, and then edit them into the narrative that we want to get through that Judah is better than Israel. Now, if I may just bring up a few points about the rabbis. Manoah doesn't feature very often. The rabbis, when they do bring him up, they're not interested in the story at all. The rabbis are arguing, if you want to make a sacrifice, do you need a proper built altar, or can you just do it on a rock? Obviously, a very important question. This is from uh, the Babylonian Talmud, Tractate Zevachim which is sacrifices, and it says, The Mishnah teaches, Rabbi Yosei says, And one is liable for offering up an offering outside the courtyard only once he offers it up on the top of an altar. Rabbi Shimon says, Even if he offered it up on a rock or on a stone, not an altar, he is liable. Absolutely classic rabbinic thing. Two, two rabbis disagree with each other. A third rabbi sticks his oar in. Rav Horna says, what is the reason of Rabbi Yese? As it is written, And Noah built an altar to the Lord and took up every pure animal and offered up burnt offerings on the altar. Noah was particular to use an altar. Fourth rabbi pipes up. Rabbi Yohanan says, what is the reason of Rabbi Shimon? As it is written, And when Noah took the kid with a meal offering and offered it up upon the rock. So that is absolutely classic, rabbinic back and forth. The story is not of interest at all. They're disputing about whether you can use a rock or an altar. And of course, they don't reach a conclusion. And I do think it is true that Manoah's story is the only occasion in the Old Testament where uh, an offering is made just on a rock. The only other example I could find of Manoah being used as a legal authority is Babylonian Talmud, Berako. Rabbi Nachman Bar Yitzhak said, It is reasonable to say that the man walked in front. As it is taught in Bereta, which is an oral tradition, a man should not walk behind a woman on a path, as he will look at her constant, even if it is his wife. Yeah, okay. Rabbi Nachman Bar Yaakov breaks in. From the following verse, we know that Samson's father, Manoah, was an ignoramus. As it is written, Manoah promptly followed his wife. <laughs> it also says what about the character of Manoah that his idiot kid comes and asks for just for some random woman and his wife, and he goes and does it for him. It's like when the kid, the rich kid, comes and says that they want a Corvette for their 16th birthday, and the dad does it, does set up a whole family dynamic that you can really relate to to this day. And I think that you portrayed that very well in your, would you call it a fictionalization or a uh, behind the scenes story? I turned it into a narrative, yeah. Now, I, I can't remember in the story, do Manoah and his wife oppose Samson in his choice of women? Well, he talks, he speaks back to him and says, don't you think you can find a nice Israelite woman? And no, and, and Samson says, no, I want her. She's, she's, she pleases me. He stamps his foot. And that's, that's the whole exchange. And after that, the parents drop out of the story. And yeah, and Samson gets this, this wife, marries her, kills a bunch of people in the process, and then loses interest. 
He loses interest in her, just leaves her. Uh, they decide to give this woman to his bridegroom, I think it is. And then he gets comes back and gets mad and kills some more people. <laughs> this is the guy we're talking about, this hero of ours. He, he does come across as a really spoiled rich kid, doesn't he? Yeah, it really does seem to be a tale as old as time. And it, you would really love to see what Manoa and, and wife, nameless wife, would have to say about the choices that Samson continued to make. Because he goes from one, one woman to another, and all it all ends bad for everybody involved, and eventually for Samson himself. It'd be a fun narrative narrativization of uh, that stupid wordplay game that he did that the people would have never been able to guess because it was only something that he knew about. And then he gets to kill everybody. I mean, that seems to be the end of every Samson story is Samson does something stupid and then he gets to kill everyone. The end. And then Manoa says, that's my boy. <laughs> I see them both very much the same character. I don't know. I would say if I were to take a, a moral or a lesson from the story of Manoa, I would say women actually know a few things and you should listen to them. And if Manoa had listened to his wife, maybe things would have turned out a little bit different. But he stubbornly was not willing to learn a single thing from a woman. I say that I recognize the irony of three guys talking about the importance of listening to women and... <laughs> Maybe that's something we should be working on as well. Just picking up on Steve's point of the nameless wife, the later rabbis rectified that. Okay. And they gave her a name. There are several variants of the spelling in the rabbinic literature. Tzelel Pony or Tzelel Pony or Hazelel Pony. In one passage, uh, Rav Hanan Bar Rava continues. The mother of David was called Natsat Bat Adel. The mother of Samson was called Zelel Ponet, and his sister was called Nashan. The commentary asks, what is the practical difference as to what their names were? Now that says something, doesn't it? Why are you bothering to give them names, Rabbi? We're just women, yes. The commentary answers, it is important with regard to an answer for heretics who inquire into the names of these women which are not stated in the Bible. One can reply that there is a tradition handed down concerning their name. Because in, in the process of turning these Bible stories into deeper narratives, I often feel the need, I didn't do it in the story of Manoah, to give unnamed characters names. And I actually find many times just give, the act of giving them a name makes me see the story from a totally different point of view. I remember one that particularly struck me uh, the story of the famous story of Solomon and the prostitutes who come with the dead baby, right? I decided to retell that story from the point of view of the prostitutes and gave them names. And I ended up with a totally, totally different story. So I have found again and again giving them names matters. I'll have to check out that episode because that's a very interesting take on things. Magnificent, m magnificent monarch. Man's Plains Motherhood, something like that, I called it. It was a fun one. I had I got my two daughters to voice the the two women. Yeah, I just saw Solomon basically trying to avoid dealing with the real issue, which was that there were these women living in complete poverty and their children were dying, and he wanted to turn it into something else. Like politicians do, right? Just a bit more on Hazalel Pony. She is considered amongst the 23 truly upright and righteous women who came forth from Israel. She is one of the 22 worthy women in the world. Now, this is all in the rabbinic literature. So they're certainly trying to boost her up. And she lived with Manoah and she, she survived. <laughs> she survived living with this idiot of a husband. 